Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, and thank you for specifically joining our prostate cancer overview and treatment options webinar. So as I said, we'll start with a few housekeeping items and I'll introduce our speakers. First, your attendance tonight is completely anonymous to other attendees. No one can see your face or your name and any comments or questions can only be seen by myself and our speakers by using the chat function at the bottom portion of your screen, which some of you will uh, have already found. If you wish, wish to ask a question, please utilize that feature. Uh, if you are having trouble finding it, just move that cursor around at the bottom and we'll try and answer as many of these questions as we can at the conclusion of our presentation. So our presentation tonight will last for approximately one hour and will be presented by urologist, Dr. Paul Yanover, and radiation oncologist, Dr. Par Mehta of Europartners LLC in Chicago. Dr. Yanover is a board certified urologist who specializes in prostate cancer, BPH, kidney stones, bladder cancer, kidney cancer, and laparoscopic surgery after earning his bachelor's degree at Indiana University with a double major in biology and history. He went on to Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York City, followed by residency programs in surgery and urology at Loyola University Medical Center in Maywood, Illinois. Dr. Yanover has done extensive research in urology and has been published in numerous clinical journals. Currently at Europartners, Dr. Yanover is the Chief Analytics Officer and Director of Clinical Research. In addition, he is currently the President of the Chicago Urologic Society, a Clinical Assistant Professor of Urology at the University of Illinois at Chicago College of Medicine, as well as the Chief of Urology at both Advocate Illinois Masonic Hospital and Amita President St. Joseph Hospital. Dr. Mehta is a board certified radiation oncologist specializing in the treatment of prostate cancer. He possesses expertise in advancing uh, tr an advanced training in intensity modulated radiation therapy, IMRT, image guided radiation therapy, IGRT, and prostate brachytherapy. Additionally, he is an expert in utilizing the Calypso 4D localization system, which is a GPS for the body. After earning his bachelor's degree in engineering from the University of Michigan, Dr. Mehta entered the medical scholars program at the University of Illinois, where he completed an MD as well as an MBA degree. He completed his residency in radiation oncology at Rush University Medical Center and entered into a brachytherapy fellowship program at Beth Israel Medical Center in New York City. During this time, he completed research which has been published in several clinical journals. So Dr. Yanover will be covering the first portion of our presentation. Thank you both for joining us tonight. And if you could unmute your mic, Dr. Yanover, I will turn it over to you. Dr. Yanover? Dr. Yanover, can you hear us? Just a moment while we get Dr. Yanover's mic working. Dr. Yanover, can you hear us? Okay, I think I'm getting the signal to go. So, uh, should we start, Jack? Good to go? Okay, I'm assuming yeah, that's a yes. Good to go, Dr. Yanover. Well, uh, welcome everybody. Um, uh, I'm Dr. Paul Yanover. I'm a urologist here in Chicago. Um, uh, thank you very much for Boston Scientific for hosting this. Uh, hopefully will be uh, in informative uh, in and helpful uh, seminar webinar for people. Um, my co-host is Dr. Parameda, who's a partner of mine. He's a radiation oncologist at Euro Partners here in Chicago. Um, the topic today, of course, is prostate cancer. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, prostate cancer, some of the st statistics uh, involving prostate cancer, what is prostate cancer, how do we go about diagnosing uh, prostate uh, cancer, and of course, how do we go about uh, treating prostate cancer. As a urologist and uh, 
and with my radiation oncologist uh, colleagues, we are the, uh, the specialties that uh, deal with the diagnosis and treatment of prostate cancer. Uh, Dr. Maida will talk um, about radiation treatments specifically. Uh, we also at Euro Partners have a, a vast experience with a technique called space or uh, hydrogel, which Dr. Maida is an expert in. He'll be talking about that, uh, how that can help deliver um, radiation therapy uh, with uh, minimizing um, the potential for side effects and some of the clinical results. Uh, so with that, next slide. So uh, prostate cancer is one of those things that uh, most men will certainly have heard of. Uh, they live a bit in fear of, um, and that's because one uh, man in nine will be diagnosed with prostate cancer during his lifetime. Um, prostate cancer is the second leading cause of cancer death in American men, uh, just behind lung cancer. And uh, another sort of, uh, sort of sobering statistic is that one man in 41 will die uh, from prostate cancer. Now, in those statistics, there's a lot of nuance. Uh, first of all, one in nine uh, men being diagnosed with prostate cancer is a statistic applied to all comers. And we do know that um, uh, the, within that group, there's uh, actually a subgroup that is much higher risk. And those are patients who have a strong family history of prostate cancer, uh, typically a, a first degree relative, a, uh, a brother, a nephew, a father, uh, an uncle uh, with prostate cancer. And that can uh, elevate one's lifetime risk of uh, being diagnosed with the disease. Also, and uh, we're not exactly sure yet uh, why, but African-American men um, have a higher risk of both getting prostate cancer and dying from prostate cancer. And so those things are impactful in, uh, you know, how we approach some of those uh, subgroups. Um, but you'll notice that if there's a one in nine chance of having prostate cancer in your lifetime, but only a one in 41 chance of dying from prostate cancer, there's a, there's a big disparity um, and a big gap between those two statistics. And that uh, speaks a lot about the the natural history of prostate cancer. It's a what we would call a heterogeneous disease. Um, there is actually many different, what, what I like to describe to patients, a lot of flavors of prostate cancer. And it's not a binary thing. It's not a monolithic disease. And one of the biggest challenges with, your, with urology and, and prostate cancer treatment is sort of defining and, def and, and figuring out of those one in nine men, who is going to die and who's going to suffer from prostate cancer uh, disproportionately. Next slide. So, uh, you know, the numbers are pretty staggering in the, here in the United States. Uh, in, in 2018, the estimates that for prostate cancer, we're going to have 165,000 cases. Uh, in, in of those, uh, 30,000 are uh, estimated to have died from prostate cancer. But then when we look down and, and dig into sort of the statistics of how well patients fare when they are diagnosed early, particularly, and they receive treatment, particularly for localized disease, meaning it hasn't spread, hasn't metastasized, it stayed within the prostate, we found it early, the, uh, the survival rate um, for those patients is exceedingly high. And, and that's actually really good news. Um, but again, it's this, uh, this tug of war finding, not just finding disease, but finding clinically significant disease and who needs to be treated. And that's something we'll dig into in, in a little bit. Um, but if you look at uh, on the right hand, sorry, you can go back on the right hand column, you can sort of see where the, the burden of prostate cancer in the United States um, is e exceptionally large. Uh, prostate cancer makes up about 20% of new cancer cases uh, in the United States, and other than with lung, it dwarfs pretty much all other um, uh, uh, cancers um, that we would uh, be finding. Next slide. So this is some basic anatomy, um, but this is really important in, in sort of understanding um, uh, the, 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 the physiology of prostate cancer. So it's located right outside the bladder. It's only found in men. And it sits right on top of the rectum. And I, I like to, when I see this slide and I show this slide to patients all the time, I say, you know, this is a bit of a, a crowded neighborhood. Um, your, you know, bladder uh, stores urine. And then that urine, when it gets expelled, has to go through the prostate 
uh, into the urethra, which is that long tube that then out the penis. Um, and that's why uh, men with enlarged prostates or prostates that are squeezing too tight can induce urinary problems. Um, but also that relationship to the bladder and the rectum are really important because when we go to, to diagnose and treat prostate cancer, those organs are at risk of uh, being uh, injured or disturbed um, from our treatments. And that can affect uh, both the urinary control um, and urinary habits of a patient who's been undergoing prostate cancer treatment as well as bowel issues. And you can just see that the relationship to those organs are very intimate and that's a very important uh, thing to understand. Um, you know, one of the concepts with prostate cancer is, you know, it's not just, um, you know, going talking about those slides earlier, about who's going to die from prostate cancer, but it's, it's who's going to suffer. You know, in, in cancer, we have this concept of morbidity and mortality. Morbidity refers to the illness or the suffering, uh, the pain and suffering that a patient may, under, uh, may uh, undergo as the, uh, from the cancer. Um, mortality is, is the death rate. And of course, our goal is to minimize both. But it's important to understand that um, when we diagnose someone with prostate cancer, not only are we trying to cure them of the disease, but we're trying to minimize the effects uh, that the disease can have on their uh, quality of life. And as you can see, because of its relationship to the bowel and to the rectum, as well as its role in sexuality, um, that is an important thing that we try to keep in mind. Um, you know, I get asked all the time, what is the prostate there for? What do we need it for? It's solely an organ of fertility. And in fact, uh, PSA, which is the blood test to help diagnose prostate cancer, which we're going to talk about in a minute, um, that is actually an enzyme that uh, helps liquefy semen. That's part of the fertility uh, function uh, of the prostate. And that's the only role it has. So we know for men who have prostate disease, we can go ahead and irradiate it. We can uh, operate on it. We can uh, uh, stick devices into it. And we know that that won't have any ill effects uh, on the patient um, because its role really is only for fertility. Next slide. So how do we go about diagnosing prostate cancer? Well, um, in the United States, it's almost exclusively in patients who are part of a screening program. That's where we're trying to detect prostate cancer in a patient who doesn't have any symptoms. And in fact, you know, one of the things I explain to patients is when a patient has symptoms um, of prostate cancer, that means the disease has already uh, progressed significantly. It's a silent disease. We, we want to find it early, um, both because uh, we've, we do believe that early uh, detection leads to uh, better cure rates, um, but also when that disease has uh, spread and it's really presenting itself with clinical uh, symptomatology, uh, cure is almost impossible in, the, in those uh, cases. So what do we do to, what, what tools do we have to identify the disease? Well, we have this blood test called PSA. It's been around for actually quite a, uh, some time. And that's the blood test to help screen for prostate cancer. It stands for prostate specific antigen. Um, that in combination with a digital rectal exam. And if you remember that picture from before, you can know that intimate relationship between the rectum and the prostate. Um, that's why a rectal exam is our, really our only way to palpate the prostate uh, physically um, with our finger to actually feel if there's any lumps or bumps, asymmetry. That's what we're looking for to see if there's any hints or clue, clues of uh, whether uh, there is prostate cancer there. One of the other tools that's not mentioned on this list is MRI. Um, and that is, there's a, a type of MRI of the prostate called multi-parametric MRI. It's something that we use very commonly these days to help us uh, uh, find prostate cancer. And we could talk a little bit about that uh, uh, later. Next slide. So a biopsy is uh, the sine qua non of, of uh, prostate cancer diagnosis. You, you need to have a biopsy in order to find the disease. And this is, again, an important point for people to understand, is that uh, PSA testing, which is the mainstay of the uh, screening protocols that we have, that helps identify patients who may have prostate cancer. But just because you have an elevated PSA does not mean you have cancer. 
This means that we should be considering a biopsy. And that speaks to the concept of sensitivity versus specificity of a test. Uh, the sensitivity of, of, of PSA for prostate cancer is actually rather high. It helps us identify people who have disease, but it doesn't have great specificity. And that refers to how well a test is able to discriminate when a patient doesn't have disease, right? Um, and in fact, with prostate cancer, and again, this is a concept we'll talk a little bit about later, um, prostate cancer, it's not really even a binary disease. It's not whether you have it or not. It's really what we're trying to these days is trying to find only high grade aggressive disease because we know that low grade non-aggressive disease is very unlikely to harm a patient in their lifetime. So what we're really looking for when we're doing testing for prostate cancer is not just finding the cancer, but finding only high grade aggressive disease. And the way we do that is with those tests, then often leads to then a biopsy. A biopsy can be done one of different many, one of several ways. It's something that Dr. Meta and I do all the time. Um, you have to have a probe in the rectum. That probe in the rectum then helps us identify where the prostate is. Uh, we then can put local anesthetic around the prostate um, in order to help give local anesthesia. Uh, this can also be done uh, when the patient is asleep so they don't remember or feel anything. And there's actually several different approaches. We can actually have the needle go into the prostate to sample the tissue through the rectum. And that's a traditional, what we call transrectal approach. We also actually um, are utilizing quite commonly these days, the transperineal approach where the needle actually goes through skin instead of through rectum. Both techniques, um, are designed to sample tissue of the prostate. Um, there's advantages and disadvantages of both. And that can also be coupled with the MRI imaging to help uh, us guide where are we gonna be sampling uh, the prostate. And that's all designed to increase the yield. You know, if we're gonna do a biopsy, we want to find uh, disease if it's there. Um, the problem with the biopsy, it's not uh, particularly fun to undergo. It can be somewhat uncomfortable. Um, and of course, there's risk. There's risk of bleeding and there's risk of infection. And in fact, infection risk is something that we really do take very seriously. It's one of the advantages of the transperineal approach is that we're finding that the uh, infection rate is slightly lower. Next slide. So when we find prostate cancer, how do we stratify it? And that goes to what I was speaking to uh, before, which is prostate cancer comes in lots of different flavors. Um, I tell patients, you know, it's like, Baskin uh, Robbins ice cream. If you remember that, um, there's strawberry, vanilla, chocolate, pistachio, all different flavors. That's sort of like with prostate cancer. And in fact, again, it's not a binary disease. We take multiple factors into account to try to figure out, um, is it going to be harmful for a patient? Does this patient need aggressive treatment or treatment at all? And you know, one of those things isn't just the disease. It's also what we, we would call the host. How healthy is a how old is a patient? How many medical problems? Um, you know, how many surgeries? How many heart attacks? How many strokes has, has a patient had? And all that will factor in to uh, whether a patient needs treatment uh, and frankly, whether they even needed to be screened to begin with. Um, one of the things that is really the hallmark, is sort of the cornerstone, I should say, of prostate cancer understanding of how aggressive it is, is this thing called a Gleason score, which you may or may or not have heard of. Um, these days, we actually use a different terminology called grade grouping. And the whole concept was based on a pathologist many years ago who came up with a scheme to give us an idea of how aggressive the disease is. And again, it's this notion that not all prostate cancer is the same. We have prostate cancer that is very non-aggressive. It's going to sit there and it's not going to do much um, over many, many, many years. And in fact, that's where this idea of, well, I'm going to die with, not from prostate cancer. And as we saw on some of the slides earlier, that's true for a lot of patients, um, but it's not true for every patient. And there are a lot of patients, unfortunately, who do have very aggressive prostate cancer. Those who have higher Gleason scores or higher grade groups, um, those also con oftentimes, but not always, have higher PSA values. And of course, how healthy is a patient? How, how long is a patient going to live? What's their life expectancy? That all goes into what are the chances that that cancer is going to cause them uh, harm or death in their lifetime. Next slide. So this is sort of one of the most important slides really is 
okay, uh, you wanted to screen me, my PSA was high, you did a biopsy, now you found cancer, now, now what am I going to do uh, as the patient? And I tell patients, you know, even before I do a biopsy, I, and I try to telegraph this ahead of time, I say, look, there's a chance, obviously, that I'm going to find prostate cancer. That's why we're doing this biopsy to begin with. Um, but there's really sort of three buckets that, you know, one of three things that we're going to find. Either I do a biopsy and I'm not going to find any disease at all, and those patients should be continuing to be screened, but thankfully we haven't found any cancer on those patients. Another bucket of, another possibility, or bucket number two, is that I find cancer, but the cancer I did find is low volume and it's not aggressive. And in those cases, um, we will often uh, counsel the patient, look, we found cancer, but I don't think this cancer is gonna cause you much harm at all in your lifetime. And perhaps we can defer therapy. And uh, for those patients, we'll actually tell them, we're gonna monitor your disease. We're no, we don't even wanna treat your disease. And then there's the third bucket of uh, patients, and those are the ones that have either uh, high volume or uh, aggressive disease. And that's based, again, by how many cores are positive, what's their Gleason score, how high is their PSA. Those are the patients that we're really seeking to try to cure. And the two main uh, therapies that we offer for them is radiation therapy or surgery. And there's obviously a lot of nuance to those. And both techniques have evolved over many years and have gotten uh, exceptionally good at, uh, at both achieving cure as well as trying to maintain quality of life. Um, but the radiation therapies we have available are uh, an external beam radiation uh, scheme with uh, IMRT and uh, uh, stereotactic body radiotherapy. We also have brachytherapy, low dose and high dose brachytherapy. Of course, uh, I deferred to Dr. Maida to describe all of those. Um, the alternative for curative intent is surgery. And nowadays, almost all uh, prostatectomies or removal of the prostate is done uh, robotically or minimally invasive approach. And just to give you an idea of how things have changed, you know, when I started my residency in 1997, patients who underwent surgery um, stayed the night in the ICU. Uh, and, and also, almost all patients who were diagnosed with prostate cancer were treated with curative intent, most of them with surgery. Um, nowadays, in 2021, we now can do prostate uh, removal with the robot. Some of these patients are even going home the same day, which is really an amazing evolution. But also, uh, up to 44% of patients who are diagnosed with prostate cancer these days at Europartners doesn't undergo any treatment whatsoever, doesn't even go uh, undergo surgery or radiation. They go through what we call active surveillance. And that's because we feel that their disease is either uh, uh, low grade enough um, or low volume enough that it warrants actually just monitoring and not treatment. And the reason why we would want to do that is we know that even in the best of hands uh, with surgery or radiation, there is potential for the impact of the quality of life of the patient. Um, and when we talk about the trifecta of, of uh, prostate cancer uh, quality of life uh, metrics. We talk about bowel, urinary, and sexual side effects of the therapies. And then that, that goes back to one of those slides that we showed earlier, that how, how, what a crowded sort of neighborhood that is. And we know that uh, surgery or, and or radiation can have uh, a negative impactful events on the patient's bowel, sexual, and urinary habits. And that's sort of uh, an important thing to keep in mind because the burden of disease, uh, we don't want to match with the burden of therapy. Um, so, uh, next slide. I think we're going to uh, now shift over to specifically radiation uh, therapy. Um, uh, I, I would like to, uh, if I may, introduce Dr. Mehta. Uh, as I said, he's a, a partner, a colleague I've worked with for many, many years. Um, he's uh, not only an exceptionally uh, skilled uh, radiation oncologist, but he's a, a very caring doctor, and I'm, I'm very proud to have him uh, uh, in our group, and, and he's been a phenomenal resource for all of our patients. So with that, Dr. Mehta. Thanks so much. Um, I hope everybody can hear me okay, and uh, thank you for that nice introduction, and thank you to Boston Scientific for arranging this. Uh, so as Dr. Yanover mentioned, I'm, I'm Dr. Mehta. My first name is Parr, and uh, the only thing I take care of these days is prostate cancer. I've been at Euro Partners now for almost eight years, 
and my practice is uh, exclusively uh, dedicated to the management of prostate cancer. Um, as Dr. Yonover mentioned, uh, you know, this disease is, is quite tricky because uh, not all prostate cancers are the same. And uh, quite frankly, we don't need our prostates once we have uh, uh, finished having our children. So, you know, having a cancer in the prostate is not always uh, that big of a deal. And yet the word cancer is uh, quite frightening. Uh, and some uh, people have uh, bad, bad disease. Let me just try something here. Is that better? So some people have bad disease where, uh, you know, it spreads and if it goes to other parts of the body, then obviously it causes a lot of problems. So the goal is always find it early uh, and then you have options. And a lot of patients will have the options of uh, not doing anything as Dr. Yonover mentioned. Uh, some will choose surgery and others will choose radiation. Well, uh, radiation is uh, the field that I'm in. And I think, you know, what I look at when I'm uh, seeing a patient is uh, who's, who's the best, uh, what's the best treatment for my patient? So, uh, so some patients, uh, again, may be better served for prostatectomy, some may be better served for radiation. The goal is cure the cancer and have the best quality of life uh, while preventing metastatic disease. In the radiation world, there are several different options. And I think this does get confusing for a lot of our patients because uh, as you see on this slide here, we have electrons, protons, neutrons, alpha particles, heavy ions, brachytherapy, SBRT, um, CyberKnife. We have uh, quite a few different options uh, when it comes to radiation. Uh, at the end of the day, what we try to do is figure out what is the best treatment uh, for each individual patient. So I always recommend uh, that you sit down and uh, have a good discussion about the pros and cons of each of these uh, different uh, ways of using radiation. Uh, in general, what radiation does uh, is it involves, uh, next slide please, it involves uh, interaction of radiation with water. And this creates uh, these free radicals, they damage the DNA. Well, DNA uh, is the main uh, uh, structure in the cells that allow it to reproduce. And when you damage uh, the DNA of the cancer cells, typically you stop them from growing. Uh, and in fact, they will actually die off. Uh, the big problem is that our normal cells also have DNA. And so any radiation is going to damage the normal tissue within that area as well. Uh, and if the DNA of the normal cells is affected enough, then that's when we end up having significant toxicity and significant side effects. So our goal is always, you know, kill the cancer cells and not kill the normal cells. So over the years, we've kind of figured out a lot of different ways. Um, the most common way that we're using radiation for treating prostate cancer is something called intensity modulated radiation therapy. So the question is, what is intensity modulated radiation therapy? Well, prior to this technology, when we did radiation, we would basically aim a beam and it would go directly through our patient. And oftentimes we would use limited beams. And that's why you would hear about uh, sunburns and uh, you know, significant side effects. Well, uh, what we learned is that we can actually rotate the beam and modulate it, which means we can actually put the radiation more of where we want it. Uh, this way we end up having uh, better coverage of our tumor and less dose to the surrounding structures. And what we found is that if you reduce the dose to the surrounding structures, you reduce the chance of causing a lot of side effects. Another thing that we are using uh, is called image guided radiation therapy. So image guided radiation therapy is where we say, look, I can see the outside of my patient, but how do I make the radiation go where I want it to go, which is in the middle of a man's pelvis. Well, uh, if we have the ability to see where our target is, then we can make sure that the dose goes to the right place. So over the years, we've developed much better forms of IGRT. So we have uh, the ability to place uh, little markers into the prostate. Uh, we have the ability to do imaging just prior to the treatment to make sure that we're hitting the right target. Uh, in our clinic, we have uh, a tracking technology where we can actually put in these trackers where we can see exactly where the prostate is uh, live during the treatment. And the table will actually adjust during the treatment to make sure we're hitting the right spot. 
at the end of the day, the goal is hit the right target. The problem is no matter what we do, uh, there is the chance of side effects. And the reason is we are trying to treat the entire organ. So uh, typically when we treat prostate cancer with radiation or with surgery for that matter, we are going after the entire organ. Part of that is because the biopsies are not perfect in showing us exactly how much disease is there. Uh, part of it is that we may have missed some disease that's within the prostate. So the typical treatment for prostate cancer, whether it's surgery or radiation involves removal of the entire prostate or radiation to the entire prostate. And you can see on these pictures here, these are CT pictures, uh, CAT scan pictures, which are trying to show us the anatomy that we're dealing with. And the problem is the prostate's in the middle of the body and it is absolutely surrounded. So the rectum sits right behind it. The bladder uh, sits right in front and on top of it. Uh, and for sexual function, the penile bulb is directly underneath it. Uh, and we have the urine tube that's going straight through it. So we are in a very tight area uh, where the dose, in order to make sure we're hitting the cancer, is going to affect at least some of these critical structures. And when we talk about quality of life, of course, we want all of these structures functioning uh, just as well as they did prior to any treatment. So the number one side effect of radiation therapy in the long run is damage to the rectum. And you can see how high these rates can actually be. So over the years, as IMRT, IGRT, proton therapy, uh, brachytherapy, a lot of these technologies have come around, we have gotten better at killing the cancer. A lot of that has to do with increasing the dose. Well, the problem is when we increase the dose, we also increase the risk of damage to the surrounding structures. So you can see from these large clinical trials that had you know, thousands of patients in, in two of them and several hundred in the others, that when we delivered radiation therapy, that there was a significant chance of damage uh, to the GI system. Now, this is more in trials that were using faster forms of radiation, which means uh, done over a period of uh, seven to eight weeks. Um, but still, we're looking at 13 to 25% chance of having significant problems uh, with the GI tract. And most of that is related to bowel function uh, and or rectal bleeding. So recently we have been using uh, the space or hydrogel. So basically what we do is we say, well, we can't change the anatomy that we are dealt with, which is the prostate being in a very tight quarter. But what if we adjust it ever so slightly by moving the rectum slightly away from the prostate. So you can see on this picture here, the prostate and the dose cloud, which is in the red, uh, the rectum and the front part of the rectum always gets treatment because in order to make sure we're hitting the prostate, which is moving during the treatment, we always treat a little rim around the prostate. So, what is OAR? This is organ at risk. Well, in this case, we're talking about the rectum. And we really don't want to treat the rectum. And it's just something that's right in the way. So when we cause toxicity to the rectum, uh, there are a lot of things that can happen, including, including bleeding, uh, bowel frequency, uh, bowel urgency. Uh, worst case is a, a fistula, which is a connection, uh, which can lead to another surgery uh, or can lead to a significant loss of quality of life. Uh, again, in general, we're trying to maintain quality of life uh, as much as possible while still treating the cancer. So the benefits of space or uh, is that we are literally moving the rectum about a quarter to half inch away from the prostate. And what this does is it reduces the radiation uh, that's delivered to the rectum. Uh, the way we do it is by inserting a needle into that space in between the prostate and the rectum. Uh, it's not a long procedure. It takes just a couple minutes to do. Uh, within 10 seconds, uh, this water that we put in there or saline we put in there will solidify into a jello-like substance, uh, which we call this hydrogel. Uh, and within three to six months, this is naturally absorbed uh, and removed through the urine. So this is something that we've been doing for 
uh, almost five years now, or more than five years now, uh, since the FDA approval. Next slide, please. So space ore is something uh, that's made mostly out of water and polyethylene glycol. Uh, we use polyethylene glycol in a lot of medical products. Uh, it's non-toxic and again, it absorbs. Uh, we do this in an outpatient procedure. Uh, at my clinic, we do, we do use some anesthesia, uh, but initially, probably the first couple hundred patients I did, we did not use uh, any IV sedation and we did it with the local. Uh, so this is something that's relatively easy to do uh, as long as you're with someone who has done uh, a fair amount of them and has the proper equipment to do it. Uh, the best part is this has been clinically proven. Uh, if you look at the studies that have been done, looking at the benefit of using it uh, in control patients, so patients who did not uh, undergo placement of space or they were eight times more likely to have a decline in bowel and urinary and sexual function uh, compared to the patients uh, who did receive space or. So in general, more space means we have the ability to adjust the radiation uh, in ways that may also reduce the dose to the bladder and to the penile bulb. So typically when we're doing radiation planning, we have all of these different organs that we have to worry about and the rectum is the primary one. When you have that space there, we can actually uh, go back and do our dose planning in a way that reduces the chance of damage to the bladder uh, and to the penile bulb. And I think because of that, uh, you do see an improvement in all of these uh, factors that we use to consider quality of life when we use spacer as opposed to when we do not. So this by the numbers, uh, there's tons of data on this and I encourage you to go through this. Uh, there's over 75 peer reviewed publications on space or uh, I would say most of the leading cancer centers in the country uh, are using this. Uh, there have been over 50,000 patients who have been treated uh, one of the big issues is always cost. Uh, and the first three years that I was using space or, uh, unfortunately there was very little reimbursement or at least there were a lot of denials. Uh, the data has been overwhelmingly positive uh, as such uh, Medicare started paying for it in 2018. Uh, and most of the private insurers have also uh, come on board uh, seeing quite the benefit. Uh, so this again is just one of the ways that we're using uh, to help reduce uh, the chance of side effects. Uh, I wish I could tell you that patients undergoing radiation would have no side effects. Uh, even with space or uh, there is always the chance of side effects. And that's why, you know, as you go through your diagnosis and you go through the different treatments that are available, you really try to evaluate the pros and the cons. And as Dr. Yanover mentioned, when we look back at our Europartners data, you know, the fact is that we have 45% of the patients uh, who are getting diagnosed with prostate cancer who actually aren't getting any uh, definitive treatment. And uh, I think, you know, the key and where we're going with prostate cancer is really trying to kind of individualize the treatment in terms of determining who actually needs treatment and who doesn't. And once a patient does need treatment, how do we figure out what's the best treatment to give them that will give them the best chance of cure and maintain their quality of life? And with that, I'll, I'll give it back to Jack and uh, we can answer some questions. Sorry about that. Uh, thanks, Dr. Mehta. I was uh, I caught myself on mute there. And, and thank you for both for uh, obviously taking some time to give that presentation. Dr. Yanover, if you want to uh, unmute yourself, uh, we can go ahead and get started with some of the questions that have been uh, sent in. <laughs> So the first one was, uh, well, the, I guess this is a combination of several, a lot of questions about PSA levels. Uh, so what can impact PSA levels and, and why do ranges vary from person? to person? So uh, I, can, I can address that. Um, you know, PSA, we, we, uh, I heard a speaker once call the PSA a, a patient stress antigen, uh, which I thought was apt because uh, particularly our more sophisticated patients um, you know, they, they monitor their PSA. I have patients who come in with, uh, uh, with graph paper, uh, graphing their PSAs over many years. Um, you know, PSA, as I was sort of alluding to earlier, also, you know, talking about the, the sensitivity and specificity of the test um, is an in, in, in exact, in, in exact science. 
Um, the PSA itself, you know, it's a serum based test. So it means that we, we draw a blood sample. Um, and what we find is that high levels usually mean that the patient um, has a higher risk of harboring prostate cancer. But as I again alluded to earlier, a lot of patients who have a high PSA do not harbor uh, either prostate cancer at all, or they may uh, not have any clinically significant prostate cancer. So that's one of the, the sort of hardest parts of determining um, why else would the PSA fluctuate? Now, I know uh, I've got a lot of patients where the PSA will go up and down. Uh, some patients harbor very high PSAs, and we, uh, despite multiple investigations, we determine that they don't uh, have cancer at all. So I inevitably get the question, well, then why, why was my PSA high if it wasn't from cancer? And, you know, there's a genetic uh, component. We know that. Um, you know, if a patient were to actually ejaculate before the test, that sometimes can cause it to spike. Um, inflammation within the prostate, you know, it's a condition we call prostatitis. Uh, that can be silent, meaning that there are no clinical symptoms associated with it. Um, or uh, certainly if a patient has clinical uh, uh, urinary tract infection or prostatitis, that can make the PSA go up. Um, we know that various medications can influence the PSA. The most um, sort of well-described is a, a medication called finasteride or Proscar. There's also a medication called Dutasteride or Avidart. Those actually were designed to shrink the prostate. Um, they're, they're actually a BPH therapy or therapy for enlarged prostates. But what we know is that as it shrinks the prostate, it also brings the PSA down. So if you're on one of those medications for more than six months, you actually need to factor that in and uh, sort of the rule of thumb is that we double the PSA. So if you have a PSA of say 1.6 and you've been on uh, Proscar or Finasteride, that's really like having a PSA of 3.2. And so uh, it can sometimes mask um, in, an elevated PSA. Um, there's also data out there about um, race and variations on PSA uh, given race. Uh, there's racial disparities as well as um, uh, how heavy a patient is, that uh, in the morbidly obese patients, there may be something about um, metabolism uh, of PSA that can alter um, the levels. So there's, there's a lot of nuance to it. And that's, again, one of the things that makes PSA screening troublesome, anxiety uh, um, provoking, and, uh, and makes it so it's not so easy. It's not a cut and dried thing Elevated PSA means prostate cancer. It's actually not, not the case. Um, our, big, our, our biggest sort of focus right now, though, with prostate cancer is, if you, is not just determining if you have prostate cancer, but do you have clinically significant prostate cancer? Because that's really what we should be trying to find. And that's where a lot of other tests, what we call secondary tests, um, ways to differentiate with PSA, free and total PSA, there's something called PHI, uh, prostate health index. There's a test called 4K, select MDX. There's a long laundry list of, uh, of urinary and blood tests that are designed to help um, make PSA screening for prostate cancer um, you know, uh, more efficient, more productive, and, uh, and higher yield. Thank you. So another question that came in was just about the role of MRI and diagnosis, which I know you sort of touched on a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so MRI really has revolutionized, in my in my view, um, the uh, the diagnosis uh, of prostate cancer and how how we go about um, screening and diagnosing it. Uh, it its advent uh, came about you know, about six, seven years ago, and has really um, become very commonplace to utilize it in a screening uh, protocol. At Europartners, we actually have a vast experience with what we call MRI fusion biopsy. So what an, an MRI is a special x-ray. It, it's, it's not using um, uh, um, wavelengths like uh, x-ray. Again, this is Dr. Meta's uh, specialty, but it's a, it's a different type of um, uh, uh, way to look at the uh, prostate. In fact, we have this, uh, it's called a multi-parametric MRI. So it uses several phases um, to look at uh, the prostate to see if there's any um, areas that look abnormal, what we call a region of interest. And it's um, fairly sensitive and fairly specific, but not enough so that an MRI 
um, is sufficient to determine if there's prostate cancer there. But if we do an MRI of the prostate and we find areas, a region of interest that is abnormal, what we can do is in addition to sampling of the prostate normally like we normally would, we can also target those areas specifically. And it's a pretty cool technology that we use all the time now where we use the MRI image that's been generated with the, radi with the radiologist. And then we uh, fuse that with an ultrasound that's being generated by the urologist in real time. And by fusing those images, we can then determine where that region of interest is. And then of course, we also have a device that's like a GPS um, system that hovers over a patient that tells us in 3D space where the probe is at any one given period of time. And there's a computer that's doing all the calculating so that we can actually target a, a very specific area. And the whole idea again is to find disease um, and, uh, and, and that has helped us do that really in a remarkable way. MRI is also being used um, in determining is a patient a good surgical candidate? Are they, uh, what, what should we do when doing MRI, uh, sorry, for radiation planning as well? So it, it has a role in both the diagnosis as well as treatment planning, but it's been a huge advance. And in fact, um, I would say uh, many patients um, who are in the age bracket that are going to be screened for prostate cancer, um, we're using it so often that many of the patients, you know, people who are tuning in.